In the beginning, in our origin, we were spirit beings up in the heavens. And there were four stages of the heavens. And we wanted to come down to earth. We wanted to have a physical body. We referred to ourselves as the little ones at that time. And we went to other spirit beings that were in the heavens and asked them for help to allow us to come down to earth. And finally it was the eagle that came to our aid. And the eagle said that he would take us down to earth. That we had to follow him and you had to go uh, travel in three groups. And he said, follow closely and I'll take you down. I'll take you through each of the heavens and we'll travel down and we'll make it down to earth. So in three groups, the little ones traveled and followed the eagle. Made it down to earth and the eagle told them to, you know, stretch out your legs because now you have a physical being and land in the oak trees. And so they came down and they landed in those oak trees in three groups. And they noticed that all around them it was water. But they wanted to get down to the surface. So they called on a lot of different uh, entities on earth. And finally it was the great elk, Opong Tonka, that helped the little ones to come down out of, the, out of the oak trees. He blew to the four winds and blew the water away so that earth could be seen. And so then the little ones came down in the three groups and started traveling across the landscape. And as they traveled across the landscape, they came across a river. And in that river was a spirit, the water spirit. And he called that first group over and he said, come look at what I am, the spirit of the water. Look at the energy that I have, the life force that I am. The water spirit told them, take of me my energy and the strength that I have and the life-giving force that I am. And that is who you are. Take that. And he named them the Wajaje people, the water people. And he said, that also means that you're the name givers. And he said, turn to the other two groups and name them as well. And so they turned to the other two groups. The first one, the sky people, Tsichu. And then the other land people, Hanka. So that's how we got the original three divisions of our tribe, the groups of our tribe. And from there, we continue traveling across the landscape. Now we as the Osage, we have four other tribes that are very closely linked to us by our language, the Degial language. You've got the Omaha, the Quapaw, the Ka, and the Tonga. <laughs> our, our four sister tribes up here. We all speak a very similar language. And each of us has these oral traditions in them. And in those oral traditions, each of those distinct tribes today talk about the fact that all of us were at one time in history one tribe. And they say that we were one group back in the Ohio River Valley. That that's where we were one. That the Ohio River Valley is probably the place where we were all one. During what is known as the Middle Woodland period, this 100 BC to 8500, that this is probably a very good guess an educated guess on, from the science and the native science, that this is probably where we were all together as one. So that's where, we, that's where we start seeing our footprint on the landscape. During the Middle Woodland period, towards the end of it, somewhere around AD 200, 400 AD, there is a movement that we believe occurred. There's a migration that starts. And we see this in the archaeological evidence, the artifacts, but we also see changes in the ling linguistic evidence as well. We're seeing a transition that occurs where the Degial people are starting to move out of the Ohio River Valley, and they go down south towards the Mississippi River. And this movement is somewhere occurring between two and 500 AD. So that when we get down to the confluence of the Mississippi and the Ohio, we're right around 400, 500 AD. And when we get to this point, the, change, the first change occurs, the first split occurs. The Quapaw decide that they want to go south. All the rest of the group wanted to go north. 
and start migrating out into the tributaries of Missouri and Illinois. And so during this period, what is known as the late woodland period, we see the migration of these people out into the tributaries, establishing homesteads, and still during this period, we've got the four, the Omaha, Ponca, Ka, and the Osage are all together as one group. They're speaking the same language, they understand one another, they're just growing in population, growing in numbers. And some, at some point around 900 AD, there becomes a centering of their population around the St. Louis area. And what occurs is a huge population growth. We see a lot of changes in the culture. We see corn being grown for the first time as a mass product that is going to be used and, and traded. We've got long distance trade that is occurring to all coasts. A huge economic development uh, springs up in this confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. And this, if some of you uh, may be aware, is where Cahokia is, where all of the mounds, the huge mounds, well they call it Mound City, and there are hundreds of them there. And this is the culture that we, we were a part of that we developed. So we know that these four tribes were there and building this civilization. And a huge civil civilization did uh, occur somewhere on the order of perhaps 20,000, maybe even 30,000 people uh, were in this location. And so with that many people, you've got to have a lot of control, uh, political control, uh, religious control, so we have the culture itself becoming very complex, and having to keep control of that many people is quite, uh, quite a feat. So we see this culture thrive for several hundred years. We see the next split, and that occurs around 1000 AD. And this is when the Ponca and the Omaha decide that they want to leave the rest of the group, and they go either north or west first, where the traditions tell of a couple of different routes that they take. One of them talks about them leaving the St. Louis area and going north up the Mississippi and then crossing over on the Des Moines. Another one talks about them just going right up the Missouri and then coming out onto the, to the plains and up into Iowa. So that leaves, of the Degiob groups that are there, it's the Osage and the Kaw that remain. Now the next split, Dr. Rankin talks about occurring about 200 years later. And this is when the Kaw decide to split off and they go up the uh, Missouri River, which leaves the Osage. And we're the only ones remaining there in the St. Louis area, Cahokia. And we're there for only probably another 150 years or so. There's a lot that is going on to result in our departure uh, from that area. There's a lot of things that occur uh, that are devastating the environment, the climate itself. We have some climate changes that occur which impact the agriculture, the food supply, and of course when you've got shortages in food supply, people aren't so happy, and you have a lot of fighting, warfare within and from outside. So there's a lot of different things that, are, that occur that result in this, what is known as the collapse of, Col of Cahokia. And so we, as a tribe, what will become the Osage, leave the St. Louis area around 1350, and we essentially move into our backyard because we have been in Missouri. I mean, this was our hunting grounds, this was our trading grounds. We are very familiar with this location and the fruits of this, of this area. So we don't have to move very far. This is a very rich environment uh, if we just go a little bit west out into the Missouri hinterlands. The most recent time period of um, AD 500 to the 1800s, we are uh, essentially ha having our homestead in the states of Missouri and Arkansas. This is where we thrived for the next several hundred years, taking control of the landscape 
and uh, being very successful in setting up our new trade networks and what will become very fruitful for us uh, economically very shortly. The Ozarks, which are the, the landscape that is in central, southern uh, Missouri, northern Arkansas, are rich with our history. And we can see our footprint in this area through what is left of our villages, our hunting camps, trails, burials. They litter the landscape. We have amassed some information about our trails that we know of. We don't know of all of them, of course. But through this area, the sacred sites are particularly important to us. They represent, you know, our existence in these states, the physical and the spiritual uh, aspects of our culture are still, they're still there. The sacred sites are, include rock art and the burials, which can occur in a variety of locations, from the hilltops, the caves, in the rock shelters and on bluffs. They're littered. There are thousands and thousands of Osages that are buried and are still on the landscape in Missouri and Arkansas. Our rock art, we are coming to understand more and more through the help of some of their researchers at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and up in Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, this is one of our pieces of rock art that is in Arkansas. The one on the left is what it actually looks like in the visual light. The one on the right is in computer enhanced version so that you can actually see the figures. And what this has been interpreted as is a representation of our origin dance where when we were coming down out of the uh, red oak trees and coming down onto the landscape, that this is the dance that is depicted in, in this piece of rock art. It, up in Missouri, we have a very important piece of art that has been created in the past that also depicts parts of our origin tradition. This is outside of St. Louis in Picture Cave, dating to that Mississippian period. And we can certainly see through uh, what's depicted there certain aspects of uh, our ceremonial, things that we wear in the ceremonies, as well as some of the actual individuals in our origin uh, traditions. We've been coming along just fine, migrating across the landscape, doing our own thing, and then we have the contact with Europeans. So in 1673, Marquette and Joliet make their, their voyage uh, down the Mississippi, and they are the first to record the location of the Osage and say that the Osage are in southwest central Missouri. They never meet the Osage. It's some of the Indians over there that now have moved into Cahokia that tell them about the Osage. So this is what marks for us the beginning of our historic period, 1673. We find out through our, through our studies of this, this information is that Wajaje, or Osage, was not our original name. At contact, it was Neokanska, which means children of the middle waters. And again, it's reflecting on that importance that was imparted to us about the water. And we have always congregated to the confluence of major uh, riverways because of the strength that is generated with those powerful so sources coming together. So we have taken that on uh, well, in the past, we took that on as the name of our whole tribe, Neokanska. The French, we got along with very well and learned the, the trade that would work best for us with the fur trade, and we latched onto that and were very, very successful. Through the, the trade, then they realized that they needed to bring in the missionaries, you know, right on the heels of that, because then you had to get these savages civilized, if you're going to work with them, if you're going to do business with them, they need to be civilized. So then we start getting information about the organization of the tribe, the spiritual organization, the cosmological organization. And we understand that they start to write about how the tribe saw itself as a reflection of the universe itself. And that every individual, every clan, every division represented a part of the universe and had a role in the universe. Even down to the very individual, you had a role that you had to play in every aspect of 
the daily living of the tribe to the rituals that were performed. Everything was highly organized, including down to the people where we have the two large divisions, the sky people and the earth people, and then those are further broken down into clans that are categorized as the original Tsitsu, which is the sky, the original seven, and then you've got the Hanka, the seven clans there, and then the Wajaji, uh, the seven uh, water clans, and then later, as the name says, last to come, you've got two clans that join us, and then the isolated earth people join us, so that we end up with 24 clans total, but the original were over 21 clans. And this organization goes right down to where, how we set up our villages, where you've got this east-west line that splits the village between the Moetis, so this is the sky to the north and the earth to the south. You have a sky chief and an earth, earth chief. They have their lodges right in the middle. These are large lodges. And then all of the clans, uh, according to their divisions, the sky people, the last to come, all of these had their places. We had semi-permanent villages. They were, uh, the, the houses themselves, the lodges, uh, were these structures that are uh, referred to as longhouses, where they were covered with mats. I like this picture, but it's incorrect in one aspect, and I need to have somebody paint a better one. The doors are in the wrong place. See all the doors at the end? The doors weren't at the end. The doors were right on the side. So we've got these that range in size from, what, 25 feet to, I don't know, 30 feet long. And the lodges vary by the, the camps, of course, but we are starting to see the organization. And this slide I threw in there to show you that the structure of those lodges lasted right on through to the, when we came down into Oklahoma. We just used them for different, uh, outside different arbors. But that same construction of those lodge poles bending them over is we carried through um, right here into Oklahoma. The subsistence for uh, the tribe, uh, again, we were in the Ozarks, we were hunting, we had three major hunts during the year, uh, one which took us out onto the plains, and that was the summer hunt for the bison and the deer, but we also had other hunts that focused on beer, uh, the bear and the beaver in uh, February and March. In the fall, they, after they would harvest their corn, beans, and squash, then they would once again go out in uh, September uh, to gather more meat. And of course, our staples, corns, beans, and squash, but what is important in we're looking at our history of our food and what, what we accomplished through time that we know as archaeologists, as we've studied these archaeological sites, we were one of the first uh, folks that domesticated some of the native plants here. If we go back to that time period in the Ohio River Valley, we've got some of the first evidence of domesticating mayflower and sunkweed, kinopodium, little barley. We were very creative in terms of trying to pull together our nutrition and actually settling down and not having to go around and chase your food, essentially, through the seasons, we started domesticating certain plants. That area, the Ohio River Valley, is one of seven locations in the world where domestication started. So we're pretty proud of that as well. After we first meet with the French and the Spanish, and then we have a real turning point in, in time, and that's with the Louisiana Purchase. And with the Louisiana Purchase, as most of you probably know, they're going to move the Indians in the east and get them out of the way of development on the eastern seaboard and move them out across the Mississippi River and over into what was identified as the Louisiana Purchase. And of course, the problem with that is you have people that's already there and have been there for hundreds of years. And so this, of course, caused a lot of grief for not only the tribes themselves, but then the government that was trying to you know, create a more inhabitable place is making it 10 times worse uh, for these areas with 
the inclusion of what now are going to be the Americans and all of these different tribes that are coming in and having to, to live next to one another, many of which were enemies. So what happens for the Osage is that we end up with a whole series of treaties succeeding our uh, land to the United States government. And this is a, a sort of point of what, uh, what actually happened and what we were, a were able to claim as our territory. This began in, with the Treaty of 1808 and um, didn't end until we ended up with the reservation in Oklahoma. So you can see the series of 1808 giving up most of Missouri and uh, Arkansas and then 1818, we give up more of Arkansas and Oklahoma. 1825, Oklahoma, Missouri, Arkansas, and Kansas. And then the treaties in Kansas, which get diminished. And in the end, we're looking at 113 million acres, roughly, which we receive probably a penny for every six acres. And it was a hard, a hard road to hoe when we look, when we look at this and look at what was once our, our land and what we actually received for it and what we've got now. So the, the Kansas Reservation in 1865, our last move occurred, uh, it was agreed upon, and then we actually made the move in 1871, uh, 1872 uh, during the winter. And uh, we moved uh, down into the reservation. And this also was kind of bittersweet because Oklahoma was our hunting grounds from beginning, probably around AD 500. This was area that we considered ours that we were hunting in for hundreds of years. And then we have to, it gets ceded to the United States government, and it gets turned over to the Cherokee, and we have to buy it back from the Cherokee, our own land. In 2006, it was very important for us that we were able to create our own constitution. The United States government did not allow us to do that for over a hundred years. So we were very happy to, to do that and create our own government, which we created a government that's just like the United States government with a congressional uh, branch, an executive branch, and a judicial branch. So our full ancestral territory ranges in 15 states. All of this is not at one time, it's um, through time. 